I think we should throw these books in the fire. It's not a quote from Fahrenheit 451. It's a quote from a school board member last year in Virginia. Book burning was also recently suggested at a school board meeting in Nampa, Idaho. The board was debating what to do with a list of 23 books that a single parent had challenged as inappropriate. The list included books by Margaret Atwood, Toni Morrison, Khaled Hosseini, Jonathan Safran Foer. After debate, the board passed a motion to remove these books from their libraries forever. Ban them forever. What happened in Nampa is not an outlier. Across the country, book bans have taken school districts by storm. And this is just one thread in a larger web of educational censorship that is entangling our schools, our colleges, our libraries. At PEN America, where I work, we've spent 100 years championing the freedom to write and the freedom to read. We unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the civil liberties that make it possible. We view educational censorship as a cancer on a free society, and in the United States today, it is spreading fast. We've tracked 2,000 school book bans in the past year. In the past two years, nearly 200 educational gag order bills in 41 states, bills with explicit bans on what can be discussed in the classroom. We've seen bans on classroom content from Florida to California, bans on critical race theory from North Dakota to Georgia. In Texas, there's a ban on the New York Times 1619 project. In Tennessee, there's a ban on a particular page of a particular book because it shows seahorses rubbing their tummies before the males carry eggs. There's more. <laughs> I've seen bans on LGBTQ pride flags in schools, bans on teachers wearing rainbow articles of clothing, bans on displaying student projects about police and racism. There have been efforts to ban whole academic courses, math textbooks, digital literacy apps, children's authors, have been banned from speaking to students about their books. In South Carolina, there's a bill that would ban sex education for all students under 18. <laughs> yeah. So finally, in one state, teenagers won't know about sex. <laughs> Mischief managed. <laughs> yeah. To me, this sounds like a country afraid of education, not one investing in it. Bans are toxic for education. They hamper the work of teachers, shortchange students, limit our intellectual horizons. Today, I'm talking about these topics freely. Tomorrow, this talk could be banned in schools too. America prides itself on its freedoms, but what's happening today fits a pattern, a periodic willingness to resort to state censorship in the name of one goal or another. And state censorship never looks good in the eyes of history. Not the Sedition Act, which sent people to jail for criticizing the First World War. Not the Comstock laws, where women were prosecuted for mailing birth control pamphlets. Not the laws banning teaching evolution in schools in the 1920s that led to fines for teachers and the Scopes monkey trial. I call what's happening today the Ed Scare. It parallels the Red Scares that followed the First and Second World Wars. Then it was mass panic about communism. Now it's a carousel of concerns. Critical race theory, action civics, social emotional learning, LGBTQ issues. The Ed Scare isn't about any one of these particular ideologies or concepts. It's a political campaign to control what students learn about in schools altogether. And in many states, it is shading into vitriol, hate, and harassment. Teachers and librarians are receiving threats, quitting, or being fired. Now, as anyone who's been paying attention knows, in recent years, a chasm has opened up across college campuses, businesses, Hollywood, social media. Some people view new ways of talking about racism 
gender and sexuality as unquestionable and urgent. Others resist, fomenting skepticism and animosity. But in our diverse democracy, we should expect to work out these disagreements through discussion. But with misinformation, online echo chambers, elected officials stoking fears and anxieties about schools at new levels from the pandemic, discussion is getting harder. Educational censorship isn't going to make that easier. It's already making it worse. Look around. There are now 19 states where government officials have passed a law, a policy, or an executive order that constitutes a gag on public education. Seven states have passed them applying to colleges and universities to constrain discussions among adults. Many of these have passed by slim margins. Most have passed amid confusion about what they even say or do. So now laws in Iowa, Idaho, Mississippi, Tennessee, they ban race and sex scapegoating, promoting divisive concepts, promoting resentment of a class of people. What does that even mean? <laughs> Here's what the law says in Oklahoma, that teachers and administrators cannot teach that members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. Did you get that? <laughs> yeah, now imagine your job depended on it. The vagueness here, it's not an oversight. That's how a chilling effect works. When prohibitions on speech are ambiguous, they're particularly effective, especially when you couple punishments with the prohibitions. Fines for teachers, the revocation of teaching licenses, threats of lawsuits by any parent or citizen. And in many states, these bills are now also coupling prohibitions with mechanisms of surveillance. Proposals for video cameras in classrooms, tip lines to snitch on teachers, mandates that schools maintain an online searchable database listing out every book, material, handout, poem, song lyric used by any teacher in any minute of any class on any day. Yeah, it's Orwellian, but that's what happens when you ban 1984. So just consider the plight of teachers here. Wouldn't you tiptoe around politically charged topics? It's actually not a hypothetical. In Iowa, a student recently reported that her teacher was afraid, afraid, to explain why the three-fifths compromise is in the Constitution. Sounds extreme, but then look at what's happening in Oklahoma, where two school districts, whole school districts, have now had their accreditation downgraded for violating that state's gag order. One is over a teacher training on implicit bias that an official investigation found did not actually violate directly the law. And the other one is about a teacher, a one teacher's classroom anti-bullying exercise where at least one student felt some amount of discomfort. <laughs> so maybe the teachers have a reason to feel afraid. Meanwhile, in Florida, there can now... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know, I was saving it. <laughs> In Florida, there can now be no classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity before the fourth grade. Schools don't know what that means. They're awaiting guidance from the state, so they're just pulling all books with any LGBTQ content whatsoever, banning classroom libraries, or suspending the purchase and donation of new books entirely. One school district recently carted out 11 boxes of books with LGBTQ themes, drove them and dropped them and donated them to the National Stonewall Museum in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, purge the books. But what happens if the students have questions? 
What if they want to ask about a gay uncle or a queer aunt? What if they ask about same-sex mating in the animal kingdom? What if they ask about seahorses? <laughs> we'll just ban questions. I've heard some argue that educational gag orders are perfectly reasonable. Government sets curriculum. Teachers don't have free speech. And it's true, teachers don't have leeway to just say whatever they want in classrooms. But it's also true that we don't need gag orders to improve teachers' professional practice. Teachers are already expected to teach to state standards. There are already mechanisms for dealing with malpractice or misconduct. In numerous cases, the Supreme Court has also made clear that our schools must mirror our democracy. Our Constitution does not permit the official suppression of ideas. The First Amendment does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. Our classrooms must remain open, open to diversity, open to dissent. And it is that openness that's now in danger. The ability of teachers to foster critical thinking, encourage debate, spur curiosity and wonder. Call it free speech or not, it's obvious teachers can't do this effectively if they're running around scared. Some people say none of this is censorship. This is parents' rights to determine what their children learn in schools. That's not the whole story. One group of parents wants to act for all parents and all students, and they want to remove from schools any books that don't fit a particular ideological worldview. People can raise objections about what's taught in schools and colleges, and parents should be partners in their children's education. But there's a clear difference between opting some students out of some topics and opting all students out of all topics to which anyone objects. The truth is, the vast majority of book bans haven't been the result of detailed objections or democratic processes. Someone complains about a book online, the book goes on a list, the list goes to a district, the district bans the book. Along the way, no one's necessarily reading it. <laughs> One superintendent told media, as he was unilaterally banning a list of two dozen books, I haven't read one paragraph of the books at this time. <laughs> That's how 52 books in Utah were determined to be pornographic and lacking literary merit. And that's how 110 books in Florida got warning labels slapped on them advising that some members of the community do not think them suitable for students. On the list in Florida is Everywhere Babies, a children's book with simple illustrations. Apparently, someone somewhere was offended that the book might contain an image of an interracial same-sex couple. They wanted it banned from schools, banned for them, banned for you, banned for us all. It's a book about babies. <laughs> now, I know a lot of the time we're talking about books with heavier topics, abuse, abortion, prejudice, or books that frankly make adults uncomfortable about puberty and sex. But young people have a right to access information, to seek answers to their questions. They have a right to see themselves reflected in the literature they read and to encounter a wide range of human identities and experiences. They have a right to consider and confront the wrongs of history. We have to at least consider those rights as we're making these decisions because the consequences of an uneducated public are dire. So, as I watch 
Parents rights activists ban books and prohibit curriculum and call police to investigate books in libraries. <laughs> I don't think their interest really is in books or curriculum or libraries. They want to erase marginalized identities, silence voices critical of American society, and shut down free speech about racism. These are helicopter parents, blades on. <laughs> the impulse to ban books and enact censorship is not new in American history. At times, it emanates from both the left and the right. But in the hierarchy of threats to free expression and democracy, the gravest danger comes from weaponizing the machinery of the state, from governors, elected officials, attorneys general. Around the world, educational censorship is recognized as a tool of tyrants there is a reason we associate it with Nazi Germany, apartheid South Africa, and contemporary Hungary and China. Americans used to shudder at Soviet-style book burnings and book purges and programs of new patriotic education. We ought to shudder when we see these purges and these programs being emulated here. We can't pretend Rampant educational censorship is not going to take a toll, and that toll will be disproportionately felt by students of color and LGBTQ youth who are already at heightened risk of suicide. Besides, what are we going to do when the kids grow up, get jobs, and don't know anything about the world? Do you want to work with them? <laughs> the people pushing the Ed Scare are loud but their success is not inevitable. So if you bristle at the idea of throwing books in a fire, get fired up about it. If you don't want to censor teachers, prohibit hard history, or erase identities, speak out. Talk to your local legislator, support your local library, go to a local school board meeting, bring your friends. There are discussions to be had about how we question history, how we teach history, how we question scientific paradigms, how parents and teachers work together through these thorny issues. But if we're going to do any of that, we have to agree to put censorship off the table. We have to agree to use rational processes and trust teachers and librarians. We have to agree that it's a problem if the prevailing concern about public education is not student learning, but fear of political reprisals. This is still a democracy, and the power to stop this assault on public education and stand up for your fundamental freedoms is right here in this room. Let's use it. Thank you.